Welcome to MHS. Congratulations! MHS stands for Morgan Haroon Sachs, which is the world's number one pretend finance company. Come with me. You will go through our Financial Analyst Training Program Boot Camp. Here you will learn a lot about finance and investing with no theory. You will rotate through the many divisions of our firm and we will discuss how to excel in 14 different financial analyst roles. I will also help you understand which finance role you're most passionate about and how to get hired and promoted in the industry. You will deal with the employees and clients of our firm in edutaining, meaning entertaining and educational interactive case studies, including how an IPO works, how to manage risk, and how to manage a portfolio. You will create incredible investment research reports that will impress the heck out of anyone in the finance industry. This course is for anyone who wants to be a financial analyst or a better investor, stock picker, portfolio manager, and more. No prior experience is necessary. It includes a comprehensive Excel template to help guide you through our training program. In addition, I will teach you Excel skills so you can model financial statements and value companies from scratch. This course is based on my many years of experience. I'm an MBA graduate from Columbia University. I've gone through the Global New Hire Financial Analyst Training Program at Goldman Sachs in New York, London, and Tokyo. I've worked for top hedge funds, and I even started my own hedge fund and venture capital firms. This course is more than 22 hours long. This is the most thorough financial analyst and investing course available on the market. The student reviews have been amazing. Welcome to the Morgan Rune Sachs training program. This will be a lot of fun. I'll see you in the morning. Welcome to our 219th weekly webcast. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. If you've been with us before, welcome back. So the way this call works is this is an AMA, like you see on Reddit, ask me anything. You can ask me business questions, personal questions, career questions, anything you want. And my goal is to humbly help you take your career or your investment portfolio or your startup, et cetera, to the next level. So let's begin. And what I'll do is I'll answer questions here over YouTube chat. And later on during today's call, what I'll do is I'll open up Zoom. Okay, first up, I've got uh, Nikolai. How are you? Uh, you wrote in corporate finance courses. And by the way, speaking of corporate finance, I'm wearing my shirt here that says Morgan Haroon Sachs, which says here, a very long and not so rich history since 2017. Yeah. And the reason it's kind of crooked is because when you meet me, I stand a little bit sideways, very slightly, so it's kind of annoying, but it, it is it is what it is, okay? And I'd love to meet all of you, uh, especially those in my, my gold and platinum MBA degree program. I'm doing my annual uh, alumni and networking event here in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, for everybody in my past six years of gold and platinum MBA degree programs. You don't have to graduate to attend. You just have to be a gold uh, or a platinum member. It's going to be on August 12th and 13th here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm renting a great museum again called the Hiller Aviation Museum. You get, as part of the museum, there's also a 747 you get to walk into. It's really cool. And that's going to be on the Saturday, the 12th. And we'll have the graduation ceremony. Then we'll have a dinner, which I'll pay for, of course, for everything. You have to pay a penny to come to this thing. And then on Sunday, August 13th, here in the Bay Area, I'll do 12 hours of 30-minute slots, one-on-one -on -one meetings with my platinum students. That's 24 meetings, uh, which I usually do on the Sunday after graduation. Okay. All right, let me kick it off uh, with Nikolai, who wrote, in corporate finance courses, is the focus on how to finance the business and how to use those funds, meaning the team corporate finance is used in investment banking. Does it mean something different? Yeah. So whenever you hear of an investment bank, uh, in an investment bank, you have investment bankers that work in corporate finance. And what they do is they work on taking companies public. For example, this here is the Facebook IPO, uh, which was taken public by Morgan Stanley, which was top left here, and a, other, and a bunch of other investment bankers here. Uh, what these investment banking firms also do is they have these massive trading floors. And these trading floors collect commissions from hedge funds and mutual funds that trade through them. 
These big investment banks also have a private wealth management group, which is the best job you can get in finance. Because if you work in private wealth management, which means advising rich people on what to buy or sell, if you work in PWM, private wealth management, you can pick up and go with all your clients whenever you want to, to another bank. But generally speaking, corporate finance means raising money, like you said there, for things like IPOs or working on M&A. Now, corporate finance doesn't just include equities, meaning stocks. It also includes bonds, meaning fixed income. And the investment banking uh, uh, staff, what they do for big governments and corporations is they underwrite corporate bonds as well. And the reason why governments can't do this themselves and big companies can't issue their own debt themselves without an investment bank is because these investment banks have distribution channels all over the world. Okay. So it's similar to to Coca-Cola, and this is uh, one of the props from my my options course in my MBA program, but it's similar to Coca-Cola. They have distribution channels all over the world to sell their products. And so Coca-Cola, only 28% of their revenue comes from Coca-Cola and Diet Coke and Coke Zero, which is the best drink ever. But just like investment banks, they have distribution channels all over the world to sell their products too. Okay. All right. Um, And then you wrote, is it similar to uh, LBOs, uh, M&A and IPOs? Yeah. Uh, So IPOs and M&A, usually done by investment banks, when it comes to leverage buyouts, investment banks can get involved, but quite often it's private equity firms that do that. Firms like KKR, Henry Kravis' firm. And if you want to watch a movie to learn a lot more about that, uh, the most edutaining way to learn about private equity is watch a movie called OPM, which stands for Other People's Money. Uh, which is a great movie with Danny DeVito. Whoops, just hit the off button there, my iPhone. There you go. Okay. All right, next up, I've got uh, Ginny. Ginny, how are you? Ginny graduated from my MBA program a couple of years ago. Uh, She's from Vietnam. Uh, Great to see you. Uh, You wrote, hi, Chris. Uh, Hope all is well. Uh, I've been trying to reach out to Renaissance Technology employees. Uh, One replied, and he said uh, his quant fund doesn't need equity analysts. Good for you for getting a response. I'm proud of you for that. So uh, Ginny networked like crazy and she used to actually, uh, I think you worked at Macquarie uh, and a couple other great uh, investment banks uh, in in Australia. Uh, And so Renaissance, for those you're not familiar, is the best hedge fund in history. It's run by this brilliant man who used to work for the NSA uh, named Jim Simmons. And what Renaissance Technologies does is they use artificial intelligence, which is a timely topic, They use artificial intelligence to pick stocks. And so their gross annual return on average since the 1980s in their hedge fund renaissance has been over 60%. And the way they do it is they have thousands of Linux servers running in parallel that pick stocks. And it's closely guarded, their AI algorithm that is. And so what their AI algorithm might do is it might take in certain inputs like weather patterns. And if it's raining a lot, then Renaissance might short restaurant stocks because people don't go out to eat when it's raining as often. Um, So he's done incredibly well. Good for you for reaching out to him, uh, to his firm. Uh, He also has uh, another office here uh, on the the left coast. I mean, the west coast uh, where I live uh, in Berkeley. That's where my son goes to to school, my my son, Andrew. So uh, 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 Jim Simmons' son uh, went to Berkeley as well. um, And my son gets his intelligence from my wife, not from me, please. Um, and he, they have an office out here you might be able to reach out to. But keep trying, keep trying. And you know what, uh, Jenny, if, if they say they don't hire equity analysts, they only hire quants, then what I want you to do is I want you to create the most incredible Excel dashboard that uses artificial intelligence or quantitative analysis, at least, in order to pick stocks. And the way to do that is you go to my, my website, haroonmba.com, uh, 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 and then go right here. And depending on which of my MBA programs you bought, you can click here. And I think you're down here in the class of 2020, I think. Yeah. And you can access the programming content I just added to the MBA program as well as the Excel uh, the Excel template uh, that I teach you everything about Excel from. We just lost a couple of viewers. Sorry. So let me go on now to my next, my next question. 
Okay. Uh, next up, uh, I, I've got uh, Ginny who wrote, uh, can you please explain a bit more on quantitative funds and how I can position myself better to get informational meetings uh, from Renaissance Technologies employees? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so exactly what I said, uh, what I recommend you do is create an unbelievable dashboard in Excel, and you can use Power BI as well if you want to take to the next level. Uh, and then what I recommend you do is you send them samples of your work and keep doing it over and over again. Uh, and I promise you at some point you will get a meeting, right? You only have to be right in business one time and you got to be persistent like I am, like a pit bull on a pork chop, as I often say. Okay. All right. Next up, I have got here a uh, JM who wrote, uh, uh, Warren Buffett said, if you, if you don't want to hold shares for 10 years, then you shouldn't hold them for 10 minutes. It seems that Berkshire has been selling stocks uh, that were recently bought. Uh, any insights? Yeah, that's a great point. So uh, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, which is a fund that, that uh, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett manage, uh, they're very long-term shareholders to the extent that they've held Coca-Cola in their portfolio since 1988. It's currently 7% or so of assets. They're long-term shareholders. They've held Bank of America uh, as, as well as uh, as American Express ticker AXP in their portfolio since the early 90s. And they've held Apple for a number of years now. Now, what you've seen is recently they've started to uh, sell some shares in newly added companies uh, like Taiwan Semiconductor, which is a semiconductor company. Um, and uh, what they've done is they've started to pull back uh, in, in, in their exposure, I think, to Taiwan uh, in Southeast Asia, perhaps because of geopolitical reasons. I don't know exactly. However, one data point doesn't make a trend. And Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger at, at Berkshire are still very, very long term focused. Yeah. And they're value investors. And I can go into that in more detail uh, if you want me to. Thanks. Okay, what's interesting though is that uh, a lot of people think uh, that when it comes to portfolio management, you should have no more than 5% of your capital in any one position in your portfolio. And I believe that too, meaning you should have a minimum of 20 stocks in a stock portfolio. However, Warren Buffett does not believe that. And who am I to criticize him? He's a sage of Omaha. He has a great track record. But their position in Apple is now about 40% of AUM, meaning assets under management, in his portfolio. Yeah. Okay. But I do believe that the longer the view, the wiser the intention. You got to be long-term focused like Mr. Buffett is. And thank you so much, uh, Icy, uh, for, for donating uh, $8 Australian. I appreciate that. That will go directly uh, to projectmagoo.org. That's Project M A G U. Dot org where we're building schools uh, in, in Africa. We finished our first school, uh, and I use the profits from what I do uh, to build schools. The first school we, we finished in Rwanda, I went there a couple summers ago with one of my students, uh, Vital, who's wonderful, he's family. And I'm going there again this summer, and I'll be doing this webcast in probably the month of June from the school that we built there. And we're going to be breaking ground soon on our second school uh, in Africa. And thank you for that. God bless you. And so uh, Icy's question is uh, a geopolitical question. Sure. China, China, or no, no. What steps do you think is needed to reboot the Ukrainian economy? Yeah. It's really tough. Um, I mean, the obvious answer is to find some kind of resolution to this ridiculous, endless war. Um. I don't think there's much you can do when, when, when war is, is occurring. Uh, one thing I've done, I think everybody should do, is you should hire people in Ukraine. And so my website, which I recently redid, I had this great guy named Vlad, uh, who's located in Ukraine, do the whole thing. I hired him on purpose because he's awesome and he's in Ukraine. And I tipped him incredibly well. And what I recommend people also do, if you want to support the Ukrainian economy, is you can actually rent Airbnb places in Ukraine. Just go to airbnb.com and obviously you're not going to stay there, but you just rent them. And that will really help the economy out because we're all in this together. Uh, Airbnb just posted $1.9 billion in profit uh, for the last year, which is amazing. That's up from a $300 million loss the year before. Okay. Uh, aside from that, it, I don't know if there's really much we can do at this point. Just try to buy Ukrainian or high, hire Ukrainians if you can for software development purposes, etc. Yeah. Now, this war, I think, is going to last a lot longer than we think. You know, my, my kids asked me in February of last year when the war started, they said, Dad, how long is this war going to last? And I said, honey, just it was Andrew who asked me. I said, it's going to last decades. This is Cold War Part Two. Cold War Part One started in the 1940s and ended when the Berlin Wall fell in about 1990. 
So that what's going to happen is Putin is going to try to reassemble uh, the USSR, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and there's a famous Saudi uh, executive, um, Saudi Aramco, uh, one of the biggest companies in the world, that said that the Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stones. And so I, I know that Putin is worried that longer term, uh, oil, which he's using, of course, to finance his war, um, is going to be a meaningless asset and resource in the long run. And the only positive thing coming out of this, which is an awful thing to say, and, and, and my heart bleeds for, for all the people that have passed away, the, the positive development could be that this really forces the rest of the world to stop relying on natty gas, meaning natural gas uh, and oil. Yeah. Okay. And thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. And Andre, thank you so much for the donation as well. Again, that'll go directly to um, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, Project Magoo. Thank you. God bless you. All right. Um, uh, ne next up, uh, Ginny wrote, how can I improve my chance of getting an informational meeting with people from Renaissance Technologies? Thank you. Yeah. So let me answer this more generically to apply to everybody in this call. Whenever you see an opening for a job online and you apply, your chances of getting that job are literally one out of 250. It's brutal. It's really, really tough. And the person that ultimately gets that job is not the most qualified. It's usually somebody that knows somebody at the company. So these are the new rules of commerce. And we have to network like crazy to get tons of informational meetings. So if there's a company you want to work at, then what I recommend, recommend you do is you send uh, uh, in-mails using LinkedIn to many people that work at that company. And you get informational meetings with them. And you just get to know them. And you help them with their business as well. And in my MBA degree program, I provide you with 12 templates that you can send them. Uh, and so Ginny got a great job uh, a couple of years ago at Jeffrey's in Australia. And the way she got it was she sent incredible write-ups in Excel and financial models. I would keep doing that rinse, lather, repeat uh, until you get that meeting, okay? Until you get that job as well. And the way to reach out to people and to bond with them is to find something you have in common with them. Now, I know everybody on this webcast has probably opened every single email you've ever received uh, on LinkedIn. And you certainly have not opened every email, but you've opened every email from LinkedIn. So what I want you to do is I want you to reach out to people on LinkedIn that have something in common with you and send a very short message to them. For example, Ginny, and, I, and I'll use you, you as an example, you're from Vietnam. Let's say that you found somebody that worked at Goldman Sachs, for example, uh, that also went to Macquarie undergrad where you went, actually in Australia, I think. Uh, and you find somebody also that, uh, that, that's from Vietnam. And you send them a message as follows. The subject line of the in-mail is just, hi. People are going to open it no matter what. And the contents of the message are as follows. John, hope all is well. I'm also a graduate of Macquarie uh, in Australia. And I'm also from Vietnam. Please let me, know, let me know if you have time for a quick coffee. I'll be in New York for the next couple of weeks. Thanks a lot, your future boss. No, no, thanks a lot, Ginny. That's what you write at the end. It works, I promise you. Um, you only have to be right in business one time. And for more details on how to do this, I have a book uh, that you can download for free. Go to harunmba.com, scroll all the way to the bottom, and then you can download this book called Networking Yet Customers, a job or anything you want. It's a couple hundred pages. It's a free download and it includes several hours of YouTube videos. Yeah. And remember that your network is your net worth and relationships are always more important than product knowledge uh, in business. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, Nikolai uh, from Oslo. Great to see you. Uh, I went to, uh, to Norway with, with my buddies in 1999. Beautiful country. And uh, there was that Edward Monk's The Scream Painting which got stolen. Remember that? I actually touched the painting. I went in to the gallery and I touched it. No security guard was looking. Yeah. I didn't steal it though. And they finally recovered it. Right. Okay. Uh, next up question is, uh, what would you say is the culture in the hedge fund industry uh, Renaissance more specifically? Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, so what I would do, and it's tougher to find out the culture on Renaissance per se, because it is a privately held uh, company. Uh, what I would do is I would go to the LinkedIn profile of all employees at that company, Renaissance Technologies, just to learn a little bit more about them, uh, what groups are they a member of, et cetera. And what I would also do, and this applies to everybody in this call, before an informational meeting with anybody, I recommend going to the Twitter profile of the person or people you're going to meet with 
and see who they follow. And if they follow, I don't know, baseball teams, then you can talk about baseball uh, in your informational meeting. If they follow celebrities, movies, whatever it is, uh, or video games, I'm a big gamer, I love games, then talk about that as well in your informational meeting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I would assume the culture there is very quant oriented for obvious reasons. Yeah. Okay. All right. Give me one second to catch up here. All right. Uh, next up, uh, I've got uh, Yining. Yining, great to see you. First time I've seen you on our on our weekly call. I hope you join us again. And we're coming up on our five year anniversary of doing these calls very very soon. Um, so your question is, how much more things uh, I can do if I want to join the buy side right after graduation? I will enroll in a top university this year. Uh, can I do a, a, a can a startup help me with this goal? Yeah, no, a startup will not help you. So just to explain what this means, uh, the sell side means investment banks that have trading floors. And whenever you see a trading floor on TV, they're selling to the buy side. And the buy side includes mutual funds like Fidelity in Boston, as well as hedge funds like Renaissance, Citadel, and others. And I worked at Citadel years ago. So the best way to get a job uh, at a buy side firm is to network aggressively, uh, like I mentioned a minute or two ago. And what I also recommend you do, <clears throat> pardon me, and this worked for me for getting my buy side jobs, is on the other side of your resume, when you meet with them or when you email them your resume in PDF format, on the other side, I want you to have a one page write up on a stock. Okay, and I want you to pitch a long idea and a short idea as well. And I want you to send those ideas every couple of weeks or so to the same people in that firm until you get that informational meeting. And all the templates I provide you with in order to do this are in my MBA degree program. You can go to harunmba.com to access it. I have a, a 30 day 100% money back guarantee. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, and the reason why a startup will not help you uh, is because, you know, the buy side is usually about picking stocks. You know, it's not about starting companies. If you wanted to go to a startup, it might help you get in the venture capital industry. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, JM wrote, last week you said uh, there can be unlimited losses on selling a, a, a CC. Um, uh, CC, I'm assuming, means cryptocurrencies. If not, please let me know. Or maybe cover calls. Uh, you wrote here, if you don't buy back the call, okay, so it's cover calls. The most you can lose is what you invest in the stock minus the premium. Uh, how is that uh, unlimited? All depends on how you structure that call. Okay. Uh, now, in my options portion of my MBA degree program in FA44, and I think you're registered for it, um, there's actually a one-page write-up that I create for you on every type of, of investment uh, option strategy, including cover calls. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, if that's what you're asking about. Okay. Moving on to Yining, who, who wrote, um, what should you pay attention to as a student when you find a new market and you want to give it a shot? based on information and business sense, not on technology. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, if you want to give it a shot, what I would do is um, I would set up a ton of informational meetings with people that work in new markets you might be interested in. And when you talk to them, you're kind of like interviewing them as well. Find out if you're passionate uh, about that market or that industry uh, in general. Yeah. Uh, and don't, don't just, don't go after a job because of money. Do it because you love it. Because if you chase, if you chase money, you'll lose your dreams and your money. But if you chase your dreams and you don't mind failing a bunch of times, then something wonderful happens. Your dreams come true and the money follows accidentally. So make sure you do something you're passionate about. Now, in, in my, uh, my MBA degree program, and the reason why I do this weekly call and my courses and I teach in general is I feel like I'm your waiter. I'm your humble waiter. And this is where I proposed to my wife uh, in Paris years ago. She said, yes. MBA does not stand for married but available. I'm just kidding. Awful dad humor. Sorry. But my job, okay, my purpose, my raison d'être, is to expose you to different careers. Okay, so when you go to a restaurant, you look at the entire menu. You don't order everything, but you might choose one or two things. I want to expose you to every type of career. And whatever you're most passionate about, that is the career that you should choose. Never based on money. And I get it. We all need money early on in our careers, especially. Okay. And the way to think about what your purpose or passion or raison d'etre is, is to think about if I told you that I'm going to give you a month off, okay, 30 days off, and in these 30 days, you can't work, 
and you can't go to school, okay, and you can't travel, what are you going to do with your time? And no matter what uh, people say, I don't care what anybody says, whatever it is you're going to do with your time, which is your passion, that should be your career. And I'm here to humbly help you make that a reality. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Next up, Pulas, uh, Pulasli wrote, uh, hey, Chris, how are you? I'm always great. I hope you're doing well. Good to see you. Okay. And then we have uh, Eglantina uh, wrote, uh, how are you? Always great. Good to see you. First time I see you on the call. I hope you join us again. Okay, uh, and next question I've got is, what's the difference between uh, the course on Udemy uh, and your personal site? Yeah, so on Udemy, I have a course called uh, An Entire MBA One Course, which is seven and a half hours. Uh, on my website, harunmba.com, I have MBA degree programs uh, that are hundreds of hours long. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then uh, Manas from India wrote, I, I, I would work at MHS, Morgan Haroon Sachs. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, what are some of the most important factors to consider when developing an investment strategy for your hedge fund? And how do you test and refine that strategy over time? Yeah. So the first thing is you, you have to have a, a, a decent track record working out other hedge funds before you raise money. Okay, and that goes for any industry. If you want to if you want to start a company, obviously you have to have experience uh, in that industry first. Now, when it comes to strategies for hedge funds, they're quite different, okay? There are event-driven hedge funds, ED, event-driven hedge funds, that's what it stands for, okay? Right. Yeah. Uh, which basically means uh, you're gonna short companies that are acquiring other companies and go along the company being acquired and try to make money off that spread. There's also uh, plain vanilla long short, which means you're long or short 40 or 50%. Or you can run what's called market neutral, which means you're about 10% net long or net short. Or you can run beta neutral, or you can do special situations, or you can do arbitrage. And I'm happy to discuss all those in a lot of detail. But when you go on your roadshow to try to raise money, uh, what I recommend that you do is you create a, and this applies to everybody wanting to start any kind of company. You create a 10 slide PowerPoint or Google Slides presentation. And on those slides, just have three bullet points each and discuss the problem, the management team of your company, your solution, uh, your financials, the total addressable market, et cetera. And in the, the third semester of, of my MBA degree program, I have a very small head. Uh, in the third semester of my MBA degree program, I have a venture capital boot camp. And what I do is based on my experience starting many companies and working in venture capital, I help you start your company and a byproduct or an export uh, from that part of the program is a 150-page uh, uh, business plan, as well as 10-page 10, 10 uh, presentation, your pitch deck to, to raise money. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next up, uh, Mike Hayes. Hey, Mike, how are you, man? Uh, uh, Mike wrote, uh, Chris, are you familiar with Hopex, a cryptocurrency derivative trading platform? Uh, how can I contact you about a very specific question? I'll be happy to pay you for your time. No, no, thank you so much. Um, just, just ask me here, and I think I say it with love in my heart. Yeah, um, I don't know anything about that platform. Just be very careful. Derivatives, Warren Buffett said in the fall of 2008, are financial weapons of mass destruction. Please be careful with cryptos. And since day one of me teaching about cryptos, and I've been investing in cryptos since 2012, crypto companies that is in VC. From day one, I've always told my students, never have more than 5% of your liquid net worth in cryptos and never have more than 0.5% of your liquid net worth in any one cryptocurrency. Most of them are absolute scam. Little side note, if anybody gets contacted by somebody that appears to be me over social media channels, et cetera, asking you to invest cryptos, et cetera, just know it's a scam. I, I'd never do that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, um, uh, uh, next up, uh, Manas wrote, uh, good morning, uh, my dear mentor, Chris, please, good to see you. Uh, what is up? Uh, what a wonderful day. Uh, you greet and meet people. Uh, it's so cool and fun to be with you. Thank you. And let's begin asking you a lot of questions. Go for it, man. I'm here for you, brother. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. Uh, and my wife is taking me out to my favorite Indian restaurant this Friday. Um, and, and I'm going to have dosa, which is the best food on the planet, as you know. Okay, Pulesi wrote, uh, Chris, uh, do you have an idea about how long you think the war in Ukraine will, will last? I, I think it's going to last decades uh, until, until Russia collapses, which I hope happens. Yeah. So what happened was Cold War Part One 
Um, it lasted forever until the USSR failed, just like all communist countries should and will. So I think it's going to be until Russia goes belly up. Yeah. And certainly the war is not going very well for them. 97% of all their troops uh, uh, are currently in Ukraine, which leaves the rest of the country vulnerable. And in hindsight, in hindsight, hindsight is 2020, and I fault the Biden administration and the Trump administration for this. Uh, I don't think the U.S. should have pulled out of Afghanistan. Because when you have troops in Afghanistan, you kind of stabilize the region in terms of uh, Russia trying to invade other countries. Hindsight's 2020, though, to be intellectually honest. Okay, moving on to Mohit, uh, who wrote, um, uh, Hi, sir, Chris, please. Um, I I've taken your course on crypto on Udemy, and I just wanted to know more about Shibcoin. Yeah. So I, I don't give investment advice, uh, but in that course, I provide you with a 49-step investment template which I modeled after uh, an S1 for an IPO, where you can do your own research. Be careful with risk management, though, as I mentioned earlier, please. Thank you. And just know that most cryptos are a scam. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, uh, MD, who wrote, uh, uh, Hi, Chris, how are you? Uh, uh, hope you're doing well, likewise. Uh, I'm going to attend uh, Imperial College London, congratulations, for a Master's of Science in Finance and Accounting this September. Do you think it's worth the money uh, that I can get, uh, and I can get into IB, meaning investment banking. Yeah. So what I would do um, is I would look at graduates of that university or any university on LinkedIn to see what they've done with that degree. If it's got them into an investment bank, then yes, it might be worth doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, and, and the great thing about, about going to a great school like that is uh, your network. I would network like crazy with alumni. Okay. Especially during your education, because people want to help you always have similar backgrounds. Always. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Yasir wrote, uh, I'm, in a, I'm, I'm a final year undergraduate uh, pursuing uh, BCom honors uh, from India. Okay. Okay. I, I got you. I got you. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I'd be careful. Like a lot of people, when they go to a graduate business school, or get a graduate business degree, they work four years first. Yeah. So I would find out if other candidates uh, from the Master of Science in Finance and Accounting program at Imperial College, I would find out if they worked first before they got those jobs. And if so, maybe defer your acceptance for two years and work for a finance firm first. Yeah. Two to four years. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Manas wrote, I I'm loving chat GPT. Uh, and be careful with chat GPT, guys. Uh, it's a cool technology, but it's confidently wrong. And I, I find that um, you have to fact check it a lot. You, you really do. Anything involving numbers, you got to double check everything. These things are not perfect yeah, by, by any means, but it's a fun technology to use. Yeah. Uh, you wrote, I'm using chat GPT for building a business plans and also for fundamental valuation and technicals. I did it for Tesla. It said it's overvalued. I did it for Ford. Ford stands for found on road debt, I think. Yeah. Uh, it says uh, undervalued. I'm kidding about Ford. It stands for four old rusty doors or fix or repair daily. I'm kidding about all that. Yeah. Cool. Always double check though, everything you see there. And I don't want you to rely on any algorithm and tell you what to buy or sell. I want you to always do your own research because nobody is smarter than you. And I believe that with my whole heart that I end every single one of these webcasts with that Steve Jobs video that I licensed from the Silicon Valley Historical Association, where he talks about nobody is smarter than you. Always do your own investment research. Don't rely on ChatGPT. Uh, and then you wrote, TikTok may get banned uh, in the United States Congress. They're going to vote next month. Uh, you, you know this. And what are your thoughts uh, uh, on the balloon and alien uh, found in Alaska? I don't, I don't think it's a... It's, so I, Mark Rubio gave a great press conference last night. Um, and he basically said it's it's what they found. And he can only disclose 99% of, of what he heard in the meeting with the National Security Agency. Those, those items, those things in the sky, it's something that the United States government has seen hundreds of times uh, over the past 30 or 40 years. But what's concerning about what's happening right now is this is the first time in history that the Amer that you know the, the Department of Defense has shot down items uh, that that have come you know uh, across the United States uh, in Canada and Lake Huron. Um, so I, I hope that they're. I want. I'm I'm a little bit worried about just escalations uh, with, with China. Yeah, I'm actually very worried about it. Yeah. 
Um, but I think it's nothing more than probably a drone or something. Yeah. In terms of TikTok getting banned, I know that the, the CEO of TikTok is going to be uh, testifying in front of Congress uh, next month, meaning March. I don't think it will get banned. But I do believe that the, we need better precautions in place, especially when it comes to kids. Like my kids use TikTok and there's so much suggestive crap in there. You know, like I'll, I'll be I'll be scrolling through and there'll be like a, a woman who's almost naked. It's it's ridiculous. There's got to be some sort of rating system involved. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, I have got here. Okay, Salman. Hello. Good to see you. Uh, next question is, uh, Elon is left with 72 engineers at Twitter. Uh, what is going on and why didn't Meta acquire Twitter uh, as they did with WhatsApp and Instagram? Is Twitter a, a broken company or something else? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so a couple of things. First of all, there's no way that the Department of Justice would allow Facebook to buy Twitter or any large social media company. In fact, Facebook, what they're trying to do with, with their next platform, which is, of course, a VR, they're trying to own the road. What they're trying to do is buy a lot of uh, a lot of startups that work in VR, and the Department of Justice is blocking every single one of those deals. They're Heismaning all those deals, so it won't be possible for Facebook to do anything like that. Now, when Facebook bought uh, WhatsApp and Instagram, they were a much smaller company, much smaller company. They weren't as dominant as they are today. In fact, forty percent of the people on this planet use at least one Facebook app every month. So Facebook is too dominant. It will get broken up, which is why the company rebranded itself as Meta because it's going to break up into multiple parts. Same thing with, with Google. They know it's coming, man. And that's why Google rebranded themselves as Alphabet because Google is, is a monopoly. You know, they, they, they own the two biggest search engines in the world, Google as well as YouTube, right? And I don't care. I use this platform. I don't care if they get mad at me for saying this. I'm always true and pure to my students, all of you. But I think Facebook or you, Google is going to get broken up. And I love the fact that finally there's competition for Google when it comes to ChatGPT and with Bing. And if you go to the App Store and you download uh, a, a free apps, you'll see that the Bing search app now outranks the Google search app, which is awesome because competition is good for the consumer. Yeah. And I can talk a lot more about this if you want me to. I've done a hell of a lot of research uh, on this, the AI market, chat, GPT, et cetera. It's not as easy as people think, right? If, for Microsoft to really pull this off and for Google to pull off this off and enter that market, they're going to have to spend $100 billion each, right? It takes a lot of infrastructure, right? It, it, it's, un, it's, it's not as simplistic as, as, a, as a web crawler for search, which is, which is Google's algorithm. Right. It's very data intensive. Um, yeah. But it's a good thing that finally there's competition for Google. I love it. Yeah. OK. In terms of Twitter. So I was watching the Super Bowl. I'm sure a lot of you watched it as well. Um, and it was interesting because Elon was sitting next to uh, Rupert Murdoch. And my gut, my gut is Murdoch will one day own Twitter. It's a great extension of his media empire. And I do think that Elon will make money off of Twitter as, as well, longer term. Twitter doesn't really have any competition. Yeah. And I think Twitter could be a trillion dollar market cap company one day if he executes. Yeah. And Twitter's going to break even uh, by next year, apparently, according to people from Earth the Matter. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, and then Nikolai wrote, is this recorded? Yeah. Yeah. I never take it down. You can always access uh, any of my webcasts. Um, I've done hundreds of them. I've done thousands of them if you include my MBA programs. Yeah. Yeah. I never take these down. Yeah. And what happens is within a couple hours of this webcast being done, one of my incredible students who works with me uh, named John Clee, he's from Rochester. What he does is he transcribes the whole thing and adds clickable Q&A, meaning every question asked to the description uh, of this, uh, this video. Yeah. Okay. And Ulug, how are you? Good, good to see you. Okay. All right, next up, uh, Yining wrote, uh, what would you pay attention to as a student when you find a new market and you want to give it a shot based on information? Okay, so the same question you asked before. Yeah, okay. And if you weren't happy with my answer, just let me know. Thanks. All right, next up, 
Uh, Nikolai wrote, my connection has broken. Uh, do you have an email? Yeah, I don't, I don't, you can always email support at haroonventures.com. I have 1.5 million students. I'm grateful for it. I just can't keep up with, with all the questions. Yeah, but always ask me here. I'm here for you. Thank you. All right, moving on to Nintendo, who subscribed to my channel here. Thank you for the support. appreciate it. Uh, who wrote, um, uh, I'm currently working on an automated trading system, something similar to Renaissance Technologies is doing, but far more simple. Are there any resources that you can recommend uh, and any advice? Yeah, I, I recommend taking courses uh, by Angela Yu, Dr. Angela Yu. Take her programming courses, uh, Python, et cetera. That will help you out tremendously. Yeah. yeah. And, and when it comes to AI, a lot of people think that it's, it's an easy market to enter. It's very, very difficult. It's very CapEx intensive. As I mentioned earlier, Microsoft and Google in this market are going to have to spend over $100 billion each in order to, you know, have a viable product. Yeah. And I think Bing is going to take share away uh, from, from uh, Google. Now, Google could have done something AI oriented, uh, meaning chat GPT oriented. In fact, the T in chat GPT is a technology that Google created. The problem is, it's the innovator's dilemma with Google. They could have done it years ago, but it would certainly cannibalize uh, their search market and would lead to $30 billion less in profits each year. Right, the margin structure on on, on these chat-based device products is quite low for now, at least. Yeah, yeah. And I think the CEO of Google has got to go. Yeah, I mean Google execution's been okay, but they haven't innovated. I haven't seen any innovation with Google or YouTube, for that matter, uh, in in like a decade or so. And they they used to have this wonderful Google Labs beta products that you'd use that were wonderful, like Gmail came out of that. Google Google does not innovate anymore. Yeah, I think it's a broken company. Okay, and I wouldn't be surprised, I don't know anything obviously, but I wouldn't be surprised if activist investors got involved and got seats on the boards uh, of Google to try to change the structure, maybe have the CEO move aside to another role, et cetera. Yeah. And I know a lot of hedge funds um, for the past month or two, or since November, at least when ChatGPT was announced, They've been going uh, long Microsoft, short Google. Okay. Freedom of speech is a wonderful thing. All right. Um, uh, ne next up, uh, next question is, uh, Manas wrote, uh, why is the Securities and Exchange Commission and the FBI going after BUSD, Binance Stablecoin? Uh, will Binance be forced to collapse or something else? Uh, what are your thoughts on leverage uh, and uh, yeah, and your options courses? Dope. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. So I I think that it's it's I think they're going after their Binance because the whole methodology of of mining coins is something that is going to be regulated, and we're in the early stages now uh, of the SEC regulating this entirely and taxing it a different way. Now, whenever you issue a product, you're supposed to issue an investment offering memorandum like an S1. And so I think that regulation is coming and please, and I'm begging everybody on this call, let me get down my hands and knees. Hi there. Please don't leave any cryptos in a hot wallet, meaning on the internet, even Coinbase, okay? Nothing is insured, right? They might say there's FDIC insurance, there isn't. Keep all your cryptos if you have them in a cold storage wallet, meaning a Trezor, which is Bulgarian for for Vault, I think, uh, as well as a, a Ledger Nano S, et cetera. And when you buy these wallets, buy them directly from the source, right from the website of the company that makes them. Don't buy it through Amazon uh, because what happens is a lot of times those are tampered with. Yeah. Okay, and, and Ginny wrote, thank you so much. You're, you're most welcome. Okay, give me one second, guys, here. Whenever I get a lot of questions, it kind of skips on me here. Here we go. I found it. Okay, good. All right. Next up, uh, Manas wrote, um, can you please explain short selling or writing options? I'm confused. Uh, can you show it on Thinkorswim, please? Yeah. I don't have Thinkorswim updated here uh, on this, this, this computer. This is my production computer, but I'll explain it from scratch. Okay. So when you bet against a stock, okay, you can either short the stock or what you can do is you can buy puts. And I'm going to use GameStop as an example. So GameStop, ticker GME, um, in, in the month of January of 2021, GameStop went up 29.4 times. 
in one month. And the reason it did was because too many hedge funds were short GameStop. And it sounded very logical at the time because, you know, in the long run, we're not going to go to a store to buy video games. We're going to download them. And also that was during the, the, the peak of the pandemic when people were working at home or working from home. So malls were closed. And so what happened was too many hedge funds shorted these meme stocks like AMC, theater company, and GameStop. And what happened was because too many hedge funds were shorted, when it started going up on bad news, all the hedge funds freaked out and they panicked. And of course, there was manipulation by retail investors, which is against the law. Please be careful of that, okay? Now, what you can do is if you want to bet against a company, instead of shorting a company where your losses can be unlimited, because if you short a company and it goes up 29.4 times in a month, you're out your investment times 29.4. It's deadly. What you can do instead is you can buy a put. And I'll use an example with Coca-Cola, which is a prop from my, my MBA program, from my option stuff. So let's say that I own Coca-Cola, ticker KO. And I want to sell Coke, but I don't want to pay taxes on it yet. And what happens is most governments will reward you for being a long-term investor, meaning... If you profit on something you've owned for more than a year, you'll pay less capital gains taxes. So let's say I bought Coke. It went up a lot and I don't want to sell it until next year because I don't want to pay ta high taxes. What I can do is I can buy an insurance product called a put. Okay. And this, this is protection uh, on Coke. Okay. And what this will do is if Coke goes down, this will go up in price. So I won't lose money. Okay. Uh, the most I can lose is, say Coke goes up, the most I can lose is whatever I paid for this put. Okay, That's buying a put. And a call is the opposite of that. Don't ever sell puts, meaning underwrite them or short them, which is the same thing, because your losses can be unlimited. Always think about who's on the other side of that trade. When you short a stock, what you're doing is you're borrowing the stock from somebody else. And you have to return it to them at what you borrow the stock at. So let me give you an example. Okay. Um, so let's say that I run a hedge fund and I want to short Coca-Cola, ticker KO. So what I do is me at a hedge fund, I call my prime brokerage firm or a trading floor like Goldman Sachs. And I say, hey, I want to short Coca-Cola. Can I borrow shares of Coke from you? And the trader on the trading floor at Goldman Sachs will say, sure, let me, let me get back to you. The trader then calls up their clients like Fidelity in Boston and, you know, the trader will say something like this um, to a certain extent. I notice you own a lot of Coke and you're probably not going to sell because I know you're a long-term investor. I have a hedge fund that wants to borrow your shares of Coke. And he is willing to pay you a 1% fee every month. Do you want to lend this share to him? And the Fidelity PM might say, well, yeah, sure, I'll do that. The trader then calls back the hedge fund and says, yeah, I, I have a, uh, I have a, a client." Uh, that uh, will lend their shares of Coke to you. Uh, Coke is currently, I'm making this up, Coke is currently at 100 bucks a share. Um, you can borrow this one share, but you're gonna have to pay 1% per month, meaning a buck per month. Do you want to uh, borrow this? And the hedge fund might say yes. Okay. So now, And then Goldman marks it up a bit, so they make a bigger fee on it, right? It's called the stock loan business or prime brokerage firm, prime brokerage business. So now I'm the hedge fund. I borrowed this share of Coca-Cola, okay? For 100 bucks. Legally, I have to I have to return this share, right? So I paid, uh, I borrowed this share, okay, from Fidelity at 100 bucks. Now what I do is I think Coke is going to go down. I'm the hedge fund. And I sell it on the open market, okay, at 100 bucks a share to somebody. Okay? And I get 100 bucks from that person. And let's say Coca-Cola misses earnings, right? 29 days from now, they miss earnings. And the stock goes down to 80 bucks. So I buy that back for only 80 bucks. I made 20 bucks profit. And then I return it to Fidelity or to Goldman, who then gives it back to Fidelity, right? The hundred dollars plus maybe a buck in fees. And I made 20 bucks, okay, in 29 days, right? So that's 20. It's actually 19 because $1 fee, but 20 uh, divided, that's 20% return in 29 days. That's how it works. Now, if the trade didn't work and Coke, for some crazy reason, went up 29.4 times, which would not happen, like GameStop did in January of 2021, then I'd be on the hook for that amount of money, 
right? I had my face ripped off. I, I, yeah. And so that's, that's what happened with GameStop. Uh, and there's a, a big hedge fund called Melvin Capital that went belly up because of that. Yeah. yeah. And even, and, and this might be hearsay, I read this in the inter- internet, so it must be true. But apparently even Mike, Michael Jordan uh, lost uh, half a billion dollars uh, shorting GameStop in early 2021. A lot of people got hit hard. Yeah. And a lot of retail investors. And, I, and my, my, my heart goes to, to those retail investors that lost money on that. Okay, and if you have additional questions about that, uh, please let me know. Please don't short stocks. If you want to bet against a stock, think about buying a put. But don't buy a put until you practice with a paper, meaning pretend portfolio on platforms like Thinkorswim for at least six months. Okay. Okay, and, and Manas, thank you for that that nice comment. Namaste, God bless you, and all that good stuff. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Lalitha wrote, um, <clears throat> how is a project charter different uh, from a bus? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer. Or then you rephrase that, you wrote, how's a project charter different from a business plan? Yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't even know what that means, project charter, sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, next up, Gregory wrote, um, uh, what's uh, on the MHS, uh, on your shirt you're wearing? Yeah, so it, it, at the beginning of today's call, I start off with this. I'll just show you th- the first three seconds of this video here. Welcome to MHS. Congratulations. MHS stands for Morgan Haroon Sachs, which is the world's number one pretend finance company. Come with me. Um, and I remember that the, the director was teasing me when I said, come with me. It was like, he says like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Remember that song? Uh, so it's it's a pretend firm I made up called Morgan Haroon Sachs. I'm trying to make fun of myself here. It's uh, uh, a very long and not so rich history since 2017. Yeah. I always poke fun of myself. Always laugh at me, not with me. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Next up, Paul Brow uh, from Barcelona. It was great chatting with you earlier this week, brother. Uh, Paul wrote, uh, good morning, bud. Good morning to you too. Hope all is well. Uh, I've been checking the Excel and programming classes. They they look brutal and brutal. I know you mean it in a good way. Thank you. Yeah, it's so funny. My son Andrew, when he was four, uh, what what happened was uh, Christine, my my wife's father, uh, gave him a present for Christmas. He was four, and he opened up the present, and it was a bunch of socks. And the whole family was around. And after he looked at it, he went like this: brutal. True story. Okay. All right. Next up, uh, Ren Veer uh, from uh, Mauritius. I think I have a lot of students in Mauritius now. It's awesome. Uh, wrote, uh, hey, Chris, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks. And I hope your new job uh, at that finance company is going well. And I hope that per our call last week, you reached out to that CEO at the shareholder meeting uh, and, and and met that person. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, we have we have Mark. Uh, Mark, good to see you. Mark goes by Satones. Uh, he graduated from my platinum program a year or two ago. He's based in Detroit. And his startup, which actually is doing quite well, is a company that mines rare minerals off of asteroids. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. So Mark wrote, uh, hey, brother, I- I'm thinking about putting the space startup on hold. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, it feels like uh, my purpose is the stock market it seems like I can't get wealth unless I'm in the market. No, dude, no, stick with your business plan, man. I love it. I love it. And if you're having issues raising capital, and I know that you had meetings with NASA, you mentioned recently. No, no, please stick with it. I'm here to help you. During office hours for platinum and gold students today at 1120, the two-hour office hours, let's let's talk about your business plan in more detail. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, in terms of the stock market, you got to be so long-term focused to make money. And I'm here to help you with risk management, portfolio management, et cetera. I love you, man. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then Paul wrote, uh, congratulations on your book. It's going to be a huge success. And thank you for reading the advanced copy. I, I appreciate it. So I signed a contract uh, with McGraw-Hill. McGraw-Hill has this, uh, it's the essential series. These are books I have not written. Somebody else did. Coaching Essentials, Communication Essentials, Presentation Essentials. And I just finished the manuscript and I delivered it to uh, McGraw-Hill for Finance Essentials. Um, and so that, that will be done, uh, take some six to eight months, uh, to, to publish it uh, and then deliver it to bookstores all over the world and stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, and AJ wrote, um, I have built a Shopify apps and currently, uh, it's in the pre-revenue stage. 
Uh, what do you suggest for an early stage business to make it uh, a revenue generating machine? Yeah, yeah. It's hard, man. So what I would do is I would have a freemium approach to it to the extent that you give the product away to a lot of people. And then once you have a big install base, then you can upsell to a premium version. Yeah. And if you want to raise money from venture capitalists, all they care about uh, is not revenue initially. They care about number of subs, meaning number of subscribers or people using your product. You know, many years ago, Evan Spiegel, you know, who's the founder or co-founder, I should say, uh, of Snapchat, he came up from Southern California and Northern California to the Bay Area to try, to try to raise money from venture capital firms. And he was pitching his business model. And venture capitalists were like, I don't get it. This doesn't make sense. Why would I want to take pictures of my kids and have those pictures disappear? This doesn't make sense. And then a year or two later, he came back and he said, remember me, I'm trying to raise money. And they said, yeah, I remember you. I don't know, how many subscribers do you have? And he said, well, we have about 6 million now. And those same venture capitalists were like, oh my God, that's the best business model I've ever heard. So all that matters uh, is the number of subscribers you have. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. And in the venture capital bootcamp part of my MBA program, I help you with that. Um, and we got to look closely at Mao and Dow, meaning uh, monthly active users, daily active users, et cetera. Yeah. And I can go into more detail on that if, if you want to. And thank you. Okay. Uh, 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 next up, um, uh, SF wrote, uh, just tuned in. Uh, I rewound. Is that applicable on YouTube? You can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, rewound to the start. And you can watch it on high speed too. So I sound like a chipmunk. And then you wrote personal question. Sure. Uh, where'd you get your bottled joy? Uh, and it, why do you stand a little sideways? Is it a form of angled uh, body language? No. So, okay. So bottled joy I got from Amazon. It's just a bottle. That's all it is. I try to drink all this every day. It says 9 a.m. here. So I'm on track for the day. Uh, in terms of, I, I stand uh, just because I'm, I'm more passionate when I'm standing. Um, somebody complained a couple of years ago on my webcast, but I sounded tired. And so, and it wasn't just one person, it was a couple. And so one day to point doesn't make a trend, a couple does. So I got rid of my chair and I stand now. Uh, in terms of why do I stand sideways? Um, it's just my demeanor. You might not notice it when, when you see me. I played a lot of squash when I, when I was younger. Um, that could be it. I'm right-handed. I, I, don't, I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but when you walk into my studio, like this here, it looks like it's straight. It's actually crooked. It's just, just the way I am. Yeah. I'm a crooked teacher. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is from Renvir, which is, how do you generate business ideas? Yeah. So I think like Wayne Gretzky, who's my hero growing up, Wayne Gretzky said that he was successful not because he skated to where the puck is, but rather because he skated to where the puck is going to be. By the same token, I like to invest in companies that people are going to like. And so I, I like to think long term, five, 10 years in the future, what's going to be in demand then? And so a lot of people right now are investing in AI companies, like you know the chat GPTs of the world, because they think that's going to be more so in demand uh, in five years, right? And the, the investment themes change all the time. You know, a year goes NFTs and the, you know, cryptocurrency platforms, et cetera. Uh, nobody says NFT anymore. It's a bad word. Um, so I, I tend to think longer term. Yeah. And I think about what markets have not been disrupted yet by software. And you can learn more about this by following um, uh, Mark Andreessen, uh, who's a venture capitalist at Andreessen Horowitz, who says that software is eating the world. Follow him on Twitter. He tweets a lot. And his moniker on Twitter is Parma, P-A-R-M-A. -A. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, uh, Pratham wrote, uh, what do you think about India buying Russian crude oil at discounted prices? What impact will this put uh, on the USA relationship? Yeah. <sighs> I'm not happy when anybody supports Russia, given what's happening. But I, I always tend to think of, I, I always have to put myself in the position of, of the other party doing something uh, and understand why. And, you know, it's, it's oil is a big part of the Indian economy. They they really need access to it. I, I wish it didn't happen, uh, but it, it is what it is. Yeah. yeah. I hope that's the only support they provide Russia. Yeah. But I'm a big fan of India, world's biggest uh, democracy. Yeah. And I think what's going to happen is more production is going to be done for American companies in India than China within one or two decades. It's going to take a while. Uh, and what Apple is doing right now with the iPhone is they're starting to move production from China to India, and they probably wish they could do it really fast, but it takes time. A little side note, I think that Mexico 
cycle is one of the best markets to invest in in the long run. I think a lot of American companies are going to start thinking more so about production in Mexico instead of China. And Mexico and America are great friends. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, Nathan wrote, can you tell me more about the VU? Yeah, absolutely. So this is where I put my money when I'm not sure what to buy. Um, so the VU is an ETF that represents, and I'll show you in a second, that represents uh, the 500 companies that make up the U.S. economy, meaning the S&P 500. And it has really low fees. Okay, so let's, let's go there together. So go to finance.yahoo.com. And then what we'll do is we'll type up a ticker VOO. Here we go, good. V O O E A Sports. It's in the game. Oops, it just went. Yeah, here we go. Okay, good. All right. So the first thing you look at whenever you're buying an ETF, the first thing you look at, whoops, let me go back here, uh, is, is you look at uh, the fees. Okay. So the fees here, okay, are 0 0.03. And what that means is for every hundred bucks you invest in this ETF made by Vanguard, which is the best ETF company on the planet, for every 100 bucks you invest, you're going to pay three pennies per year in fees, which is nothing. Nothing. Mutual funds charge a couple hundred basis points per year. They're a ripoff and they underperform this index. The next thing you look at is you look at the average volume. And I always want you to think, can I get in and out of this stock if need be within an hour? You certainly can because 4 million times 380 or so is it's a hell of a lot. Yeah, it's billions or whatever. Yeah. Um, okay, then what you do is you go to holdings. And the holdings uh, in this case are the 12 sectors of the S&P 500 that comprise the breadth and depth of the U.S. markets right here. Uh, and so we see here that technology is the biggest component uh, of the S&P 500, ticker V. And this is one reason why the, the uh, United States underperformed Europe in the last couple of months of last year was because technology companies were, were firing like crazy. It was brutal. They're cutting into muscle, not just fat. And Europe does not have as many technology companies as the United States. So this is the breadth and depth of the U.S. economy. So it's no surprise the largest position is Apple and Microsoft. And then we have to go all the way down here before we get our first non-tech firm. Okay, and this is basically a big insurance company called Berkshire Hathaway. They own a lot of insurance companies. Yeah. And NVIDIA, which is probably the best chat GPU type AI investment on the planet, uh, is right here. And I think NVIDIA is going to do incredibly well. Do your research first, though. Yeah. Now, if you want to do more research on, on ETFs to buy, you can go to ETFDB, ETFdatabase.com. And you can look at ETFs by geography, by type, uh, et cetera. Yeah. But make sure to look always at the fees and, and the volume as part of your investment research process. Yeah. But I love to put money uh, in the VU um, when I'm not sure what else to buy. Because historically, the S&P is up 10.5% on average. Historically. right? Obviously, it was down a lot last year. This year, will probably be up a bit. Who knows? Um, and so if all you did was you took your retirement savings program uh, amount every year of 20 or 22K, and you put it into the VU at a 10.5% average return, then in 20 years, you'd have over a million bucks. If your spouse did it as well, you'd have over 2 million bucks in 20 years. If you have kids and you maxed out the ESA or educational savings account or 529 program for them, then you'd have several million dollars more. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Ake wrote, uh, good morning, Chris. Good morning. Um, I'm going to start an e-commerce website with Shopify to sell print-on-demand clothing. Uh, I want to start this business alongside my sister who lives in Canada. Awesome. That's where I'm from. And I want to target American or Canadian audiences. Uh, will it be profitable? And how to start this business so that it might not fail? Yeah. I don't think you should start it until you write a business plan. Because failing to plan is planning to fail. And in my MBA program, the third semester, I teach you all that stuff from scratch. Write a full business plan first. And pay particular attention, please, to your financial statements, which I teach you about. Specifically, your income statement forecast. A lot of people, when they start a company, they don't write a business plan. And if they do, they just, follow, they, they just focus on the qualitative aspects. I want you to, to focus mainly on the financial statements, meaning model revenue and everything else mainly or pretty much is a percent, uh, uh, all expenses are a percent of revenue. Okay, focus on the numbers because without numbers, it's an idea and that's it. Yeah, yeah. And be careful with that business as well because there's hefty competition from Vista Print and many other companies uh, that, that compete in that market. Yeah, yeah. 
but write a full business plan first. And I'm here to humbly help you with it every single week forever on this weekly call. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Nikolai wrote, uh, my question was really, is the corporate finance course you have, uh, in, 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 is the corporate finance course you have in uni, university, the same as corporate finance division uh, in uh, investment banking? Yeah. So that course, uh, yeah. Like w what I teach you in my MBA degree program is much more comprehensive than the corporate finance programs you'll learn when you work at companies and in MBA schools, most of them. Yeah. yeah. And I put my reputation on the line on that. And I don't teach you any theoretical crap, right? I teach you all the basics of finance and accounting and much, much more. And, and I also teach you more sophisticated things like options, et cetera. I teach you how to value companies. I teach you everything about these things in case studies as well. This is the, the Facebook IPO uh, S1 from 2012. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next up, we have Eric. Eric, how are you? Uh, Eric uh, started a couple of companies in Sarasota, Florida, uh, clean tech companies. He's doing well. And he's my gold MBA program. So Eric wrote, what is the discount premium on large block trades? Yeah. So whenever you buy anything in size, you get a discount, right? And so if it's a large block trade uh, that one uh, sell side uh, firm like a Goldman Sachs is trying to do, they usually do it after the market closes, usually at 4.02 or 4.03 p.m. New York time. And it depends on the size, right? It's usually a 5% or so discount if it's a massive amount of shares, Okay. All right. Uh, and then uh, Nikolai wrote, it, it's a bit confusing uh, with respect to, I guess you're referring to investment banking or, or something. Yeah. If you have uh, questions, uh, let me know. I'm here, I'm here to humbly help. Okay. Uh, Eric wrote, uh, analyzing global large cap stocks in January of 2022, almost 90% of stocks had positive ROI. I guess they went up. Uh, uh, December 2022, the same group of stocks 47% of positive ROI. What's a company do uh, when ROI? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and let me, I'm so sorry. It just skipped on me. It happens sometimes. Okay. Hold on one second, Eric. All right. Hold on a second. Okay. What's a company do when ROI turns negative? Okay. So when you say ROI, I, I guess you're referring to when the stock goes down. Um, so if a stock goes down materially, uh, what happens is uh, a company that has a, a healthy cash balance, um, they usually buy back shares. Yeah. If the stock is undervalued. And once you see a hell of a lot of buying back, that could signal that the market is bottoming. Now, what a lot of people monitor, myself included, are mutual fund inflows and outflows. <clears throat> and mutual fund outflows, <clears throat> mutual fund outflows were extraordinarily high in January of 2022. Uh, and so I got a little bit careful with my investments at that point. Yeah. So I would watch that closely. Okay. And it makes sense too, because if you see massive mutual fund inflows, then mutual fund managers have to buy more stocks. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Next up. Um, Yeah. Uh, Nikolai wrote, corporate finance division is separate from trading and wealth management. It is, but investment bank. Okay. So investment banks have a lot of different departments. Okay. There's investment bankers that do M&A, do stuff like this as well, IPOs. They also have a trading floor, <coughs> equity research, private wealth management. Yeah. And about 75% of people that work at all investment banks are in sales. Okay. Uh, uh, next up, uh, and, and Nikolai, if you want, what I'll do is shortly, I'll open up Zoom uh, and you can get on Zoom and ask me all these questions, especially if you have follow-ups. Yeah. Thank you. If you want, or just keep typing them here. Up to you. Okay. Uh, Eric wrote, um, how do you determine a stock's equity risk implied premium? Yeah. So when you're using discounted cash flow to value companies, you, you calculate what's called the weighted average cost of capital to discount future cash flows, okay? Part of that is the cost of debt, right? And you get uh, a, a tax incentive there. And the other part of that is cost of equity. So the cost of equity, what you do uh, is you take the risk-free rate, which is the lowest rate in the world, which is US treasuries usually. Then what you do is you add that to the beta of that company times what you think the market return is gonna be minus the risk-free rate. 
Let me just stick with beta. And so if a company has a beta <coughs> of over two, like Tesla, <coughs> then that means the cost of equity for them is going to be a lot higher. Okay. And so beta represents how volatile a stock is relative to the market. So the S&P 500, assume the beta is one. Okay. It's calculus, the rise over the run. If a company like Tesla has a beta of two, it means it's twice as risky as the S&P. So if the S&P goes up 1%, Tesla will go up 2% on average and vice versa. And so the lower the beta, the lower the risk premium is going to be when you calculate the cost of equity. Like Campbell's Soup has a beta of only 0.38, right? Because it's, it's counter cyclical, it's not a volatile stock, volatile stock. And if you have more questions on that, <clears throat> or if you want me to do a case study in any ticker, you let me know and I'll calculate the equity risk premium for you in real time. Yeah. All right. Next question is, I was appointed as a financial economics tutor in my university. Nice. When one teaches to learn. My first tutorial is tomorrow. How can I be the best tutor uh, this university has ever had? Yeah. Excellent. Oh, I love it. Good for you. Um, so what I recommend is when you teach finance or anything to use a lot of props. Okay. I would use a ton of props if you can, because people can visualize this stuff and understand it much better. Yeah. So use props. It's kind of like show and tell. When I was younger in school, I don't remember anything a teacher said, but I remember the props the teachers might have had or my buddies' props they brought in for show and tell. Props work. We are much more visual. Yeah. And if you want, you can tell me and join me on Zoom later today or just tell me exactly what topics you're going to be teaching as a finance tutor tomorrow. And I'll help you with the curriculum in real time yeah. using props. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Alex wrote, uh, my mentor, uh, as some like to call you, Chris, please, Alex P. from Utah. Yeah. Uh, Alex wrote, uh, did you hear the news that Subway is looking to sell itself and is looking for advice from JP Morgan? What are your thoughts? Also, would you ever eat at a Subway in Palo Alto? Palo Alto? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, whenever I go to Subway, which I love, I always get the salad, lots of avocado, chicken, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I did a long vlog on, on Subway in terms of why it's tough to invest in a Subway franchise. Um, you can always do a search on, on YouTube. The problem with Subway, I looked at it years ago, and Subway is the largest franchise in the world, much larger than McDonald's. The problem is if your franchise is doing really well, what Subway does is they open another, they franchise another one pretty close to where you are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, advice from JP Morgan, um, I, I I, I guess it's a private company. Eh? Um, I don't know if they're looking to sell the whole company. Maybe they're just looking to uh, to to, uh, to 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 sell secondary shares so that insiders uh, can get paid. Uh, and maybe they might issue primary shares, meaning new shares uh, for general corporate purposes, which means using that money to acquire other companies or expand geographically, et cetera. Yeah, I'd have to read through the uh, the S one filing. Uh, or the investment offering memorandum, or any publicly disclosed uh, information on that to provide you with, with more color. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, and then Ake wrote, uh, I believe in blockchain. Cool. Uh, I think that blockchain community right now is getting rid of the trashy companies. I don't believe in Coinbase or, or, or Binance. Yeah. Anytime there's a new secular growth market, there's always going to be a lot of scammers and crappy companies. Right, and all ships rise uh, initially, and then there's a day of reckoning. It happened in 1999, in actually March of 2000, when um, uh, when dot com bubble one burst, and companies like Pets.com, which sell sold online pet food, uh, crashed. Yeah, it always happens. There, there's always scammers, snake oil salesmen, etc., in brand new markets. Yeah, and then comes a crash, and then regulation comes. It's just what happens. Yeah. All right. Uh, Electronics Onsite donated $5. Thank you. That's Eduardo from Texas. Great to see you. Eduardo was in my gold program and then asked for a refund. And I'd love to see you here. Thank you. It's great to see you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Eduardo wrote, uh, and, and by the way, Eduardo's son uh, is an expert in ta Taekwondo. And we are going to see him in the Olympics one day. 
So Eduardo wrote, uh, hey, Chris, what happens to mortgage loans if there's an economic reset? And, and by the way, you don't, you don't have to donate money, but God bless you. I love you. What happens to mortgage uh, loans if there's an economic reset and the dollar loses all its value? Uh, will the mortgage loans uh, get uh, rewritten? Yeah. It all depends. It all depends on what kind of insurance they have on them, right? And so what happened in 2008 was uh, we had credit default swaps, Okay, credit. So there, there's four types of derivatives, futures, options, forwards, and swaps. And swaps are like insurance contracts. Okay. And so what happened was there was a lot of insurance contracts written on subprime mortgage products uh, back in 2008. And most of that was sold by AIG, who sold half a trillion dollars worth of, of CDOs. Okay. Um, and, and basically the government had to bail them out. Since that took place, that crisis, as I mentioned earlier, with cri after a crisis comes regulation. Uh, Bernie Frank and other, Bernard Frank and others, who's a congressman, um, created new regulations so that we probably won't see this type of mortgage collapse again. Now, I think what you're implying is what happens uh, if nobody wants to buy U.S. debt anymore? Then the whole world is broken. The very uh, financial system is broken the very last entity on the planet to go bankrupt would be the U.S. government. It is what it is. It's why people, when they think about the risk-free rate, they use uh, they use the U.S. Treasury uh, instead of using LIBOR, which is London Interbank Offer Rate. They don't use that anymore. I highly doubt that that would happen, though, in, in this case. right? And, and some people think, well, well, China is saber-rattling right now. China buys a lot of our debt. Maybe they'll just stop buying our debt. Well, it would hurt China more than it would hurt America. Because China, you know, it's, it's a command-based system uh, where they, they're really careful about social unrest. Um, and what happened in Tiananmen Square is just the tip of the iceberg. And China is very much dependent on the United States as an export-oriented country for now. Longer term, they're trying to build up their internal economy to be more domestic-focused. But if they stop buying U.S. treasuries and if a trade war started, it would hurt China more than it would hurt America. Things are never as bad as we think. And a lot of people are, are saying the media tries to create controversy uh, to the extent that you, you keep watching. So you might be watching CNN or Fox News just to cover both sides. And they might say something like, find out why the U.S. economy is going to go bankrupt after this commercial break. It's not going to happen. I know right now there's a, there's a debt crisis, crisis in Congress right now. Democrats want to spend more. Republicans don't. Uh, Republicans kind of control Congress, sort of. So what's going to happen is they'll meet in the middle. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of first world countries' debt getting downgraded, um, if it happens, historically, and I've done a lot of research on this, one year after a first world country's debt gets downgraded, in almost all cases, the stock market is higher because the market kind of anticipates it. And I've got historical precedents with the United States about eight or nine years ago, uh, also with Canada, uh, also Japan. Yeah. Things aren't as bad as we think. Yeah. Don't listen to Nouriel Roubini. All right, next up, uh, Nikolai wrote, uh, where can I take Excel and coding classes? Uh, I'm already enrolled in your courses uh, on Udemy. Yeah, so my 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 how to program and Excel stuff um, if, if you go to my website, uh, it's it's only available as part of my, my MBA degree program. Um, and if you're already registered for my MBA program, you can click here on whatever program you guys have registered for over the years. And it'll take you directly to uh, that part of the curriculum where, where I cover that. I mean, the, the elective. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, but I'm working on something new for Udemy. It's called the, uh, I just started working on it. Uh, it's called the Complete uh, Economics Course and how to use macroeconomics to help you invest better. Like all this fixed income stuff. And all these smart people that work at hedge funds that trade uh, stocks, et cetera, or invest in stocks, the ones that do best longer term, they all have friends that know a lot about economics, meaning fixed income. And those friends usually tell them when the market is not going to be doing well in advance. And they look at certain factors like the yield curve, et cetera. And if anybody wants me to go through a yield curve 101 right now, I'll do it. 
and I'll show you data in real time and what this inverted yield curve means. Yeah. But quite often for investors, if you get the macro wrong, the micro doesn't matter. Okay. Um, uh, Ake wrote, I have a great idea for a blockchain industry that will be completely decentralized. Um, I want to one day create a company that will dethrone all the biggest banks uh, in the world. Yeah. Interesting. And that's what a lot, a lot of cryptocurrency purists think about, especially um, uh, Satoshi, if that person exists. Uh, that's why they, they kind of started Bitcoin in 2009. Yeah. If you want to learn how to code and create a blockchain from scratch, there's a really smart guy, nice guy uh, from Australia uh, named Kirill. And he teaches how to do this on, I think it's on Udemy. He teaches. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to uh, uh, Visme who wrote... Um, I'm an aspiring founder. Awesome. Um, I'm having a wonderful startup idea, but I cannot find a suitable co-founder. So what do I do? Yeah. It depends who you are. Like if, if you're more of a salesperson like, uh, and marketing person like a Steve Jobs, you need to find a, a techie like your Wozniak, right? If you're a Woz and you're, you're a techie and you need to find a, I don't know, a sales-oriented person, you need to find your jobs to complete your yin-yang, so to speak. And so what I recommend doing is I recommend going to meetup.com and going to events to meet people that can fill that gap in your management team. Let me show you an example. Okay. So there's this website, uh, meetup.com. It's free to use. And so what, what you can do is you enter in the city right? Anywhere in the world and whatever topic it is. So say that it's a software company you're into and you want to, I don't know, find somebody that knows how to code Python. You enter that uh, and then you enter in your, your city. Uh, let me let me enter in Riyadh. Riyadh. Okay. Uh, and then uh, what you can do is you can you can attend these events for free uh, in, in line. Apparently Tel Aviv is close to Riyadh. The search engine here is is, is not perfect, uh, but if you look through it, you will find a, a lot of these. Um, yeah, there are definitely events in Riyadh, I promise you, when it comes to, to Python. I don't know why it's showing Mumbai, but you, you get the idea. You can attend these things in person if you want to, or you can attend them um, uh, uh, remotely. So 90210. Yes, I am that old. I watched that show when I was a kid, 8 million years ago. Yeah, but you, you, you get the idea. Okay. That's one way. There's other ways too. If you want me to discuss other ways, I can go there as well. Thanks. Uh, but the best thing to do is just go to my website, download my networking book, runembea.com. That will help you network on steroids. Yeah. And of course, I teach you much more about that in the first semester of my MBA program. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, Manas wrote, I think that NFT and the metaverse is as bad as saying as the F-bomb. Uh, dude, I remember years ago, I said uh, WTF in front of my mother. And my mother is, you know, she's very polite, right? She's proper. She's actually the best. Um, and she asked me, honey, what is what is what does WTF mean? And I didn't know what to say. I was nervous. And I said, oh, it stands for why the face. And so she was like playing bridge with her friends or whatever. And she said uh, WTF. And her friends were mortified. They're like, Jacqueline, well, why would you say that? Yeah. Okay. Next up, what do you think about ICT? I don't know what that is. If that's a ticker of a stock, let me know. I'll look it up and do research in, in real time here. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Ake wrote, I personally don't want Russia to fail. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want Russian people to starve, uh, but the whole Putin invading Ukraine thing is just wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, you wrote, I, I want the government to fall. Yeah, me too. So that the so that Russians could have a better government one day. Amen to that. I agree completely. Yeah, uh, maybe Alexei uh, uh, could be a great uh, president for Russia. Uh, great guy. Yeah, anybody but Putin. Anybody. And what Putin did uh, during university, um, he has a geology degree, and his thesis was was this: How much more powerful could Russia become if they controlled natural resources? Yeah. And of course, he completely disagreed uh, with Perestroika, Glasnost, and, and the breakup of the Soviet Union. Yeah. But he's no dummy financing this war with oil. It's evil. Okay. Uh, next up question is, 
if you look at uh, a lot, what I'm going to do right now, guys, by the way, is I'm going to open up Zoom uh, and you can keep asking questions here over YouTube chat or you can do it via Zoom. So the way to access Zoom, if you want to be on the Zoom call now with me, is you go to Heroin MBA, sorry, Haroon MBA. My last name rhymes with baboon. Now you'll never forget. Slash Zoom. Okay. So HaroonMBA.com slash Zoom, all lowercase. Okay. And then you click this here and then you can join Zoom. So let me let me set this up as I take more questions here. Okay. Launch meeting. All right. And that, that will launch uh, in the background. I think it's launching. Come on. Here we go. Good. Okay. A little side angle. Okay, cool. I'll put this on mute until I see people join. All right. Let's go back here to full mode, Chris. Okay. Uh, next up, if you look at the long term, we will have a new economic superpower, maybe China, uh, if they're already an economic superpower. Yeah, the second biggest economy in the world. Uh, and then he wrote, if yes, then will the yen be more powerful? China launched digital yen. Yeah. So in, in terms of Japan uh, with, with with the yen, so it breaks my heart. I, I love Japan, but it's, it's, it's in secular decline. So right now, Japan, which is like the fifth biggest economy in the world or so, um, I think California might have passed Japan or is about to. I, I could be wrong on that. But Japan has 130 million people. And they're going to have 80 million people by the year 2050. It's really sad. People are not getting married or having kids. Yeah, breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. I, I hope things can be turned around there. Yeah. Okay. Because I think the world's a better place uh, with, with a strong Japan. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, in terms of the next question, or you wrote, stay healthy and happy. As always, see you next week and forever. And, and thank you. God bless you. Okay, and then you wrote, because you love dosa, uh, you should try chole. Uh, it's heaven on earth for sure. I, I love it. Chole, but to, I'm going to take a picture of that because my wife and I are going out this Friday uh, to um, to dinner. And I want to try that. And I want to pronounce it right too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Chole batur. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Nikolai wrote, um, how do I join Zoom? Uh, uh, do I need an invite? Maybe a stupid question. But anyways, no, there's no stupid questions. Only, only stupid answers by stupid professors like me. So just go over to um, haroonmba.com slash Zoom. Okay, look, we have a lot of people that want to join here. Great. All right. So what I'm going to do is um, if you guys have a question on Zoom, please lift your hands. You can either go like this uh, or in the um, bottom right-hand corner. Uh, you'll see a uh, reaction. You click reaction here. I'm trying to work on my posture. Uh, you see reaction here and just lift your hand that way. Okay, let me change uh, video angles here. Uh, give me one second, guys. Sorry about this. Test beer. Check. Ah. Okay, it works. Great. Excellent. Hey there, we have, we have Daniel uh, from Fresno, California, who's in my MBA program. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, and so if you guys have questions, just lift your hand up and I'm more than happy to, to answer questions uh, for you. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, next up, Alex P. from Utah wrote, uh, in other news, uh, the NBA All-Star Weekend is in Salt Lake City in a couple of days. If you happen to watch it, uh, please think of me, LOL. I, I will. I will. And my sons will definitely be watching. My sons are hooked on NBA 2K, which is getting so good. I mean, the, the faces are not realistic enough um, unless you're like Michael Jordan. It looks like Michael Jordan. Everyone else looks like a stick man. Yeah, but they, they play that all the time. All the time. Okay, cool. All right. Um, okay. Uh, uh, next up, um, uh, Ake wrote, um, have you tried the game Hogwarts Legacy? Uh, I recommend it. Amazing game, Magical. I'll check it out. Thank you. I, I know it's interesting because that was the first, uh, the first notable game that's only been released on next-gen consoles. So, uh, meaning before the old gens. So it was released on PS5 and the new Xbox, but not the PS4 yet. And it comes out in a couple of months for the PS4. It's really interesting that's happened. I haven't seen that happen before. Yeah, yeah. You got to wonder if, if they got comp for doing that. Yeah, but I will I will check it out. What I am playing uh, right right now, and, and I'll come back to Zoom in a second. Um, uh, tell you what, if anybody has a question on Zoom, just start talking. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll come back here and, and I'll hear you guys. Thanks. Um, but what I'm hooked on right now is The Last of Us uh, Part 1 Remastered. I'm watching the show. It's a masterpiece on HBO. 
Um, but I'm playing the game, and it is unbelievable. And the great thing about getting older is I played The Last of One Part One years ago, but I forgot about it. So it's cool, man. I, I get to play it all over again. But Last of Us, is it's a masterpiece. You guys got to try it if, if you have a PS4 or 5, whatever it is, the remastered version. I have to play with the lights on because it terrifies me. Yeah, scary. Yeah. yeah. I even got up at noon on Monday because I played it all night on Sunday. Because I can. Because I'm a child. Yeah. All right. Um, let's go here. Give me one second, guys. Sorry. I'll try to, yeah, how are you? Yeah, wrote, hello, everyone. Yeah, is from Colorado. She's in my, my MBA program as well. Uh, so yeah, wrote, um, how do you mentally, emotionally, et cetera, deal with setbacks uh, in business? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I have a very positive attitude, uh, naively positive to be intellectually honest, to the extent that whenever I have a setback, I always ask myself, what's good about this? So, you know, I've had a lot of students that have issues with their business over the past year, and they've turned that weakness into a strength. So I always think about what's positive about this. Like if, if you lose your job, which has happened to all of us, you might not understand it now, but many years from now, you look back and say, thank God it happened. Thank you, God, for guiding me down a different path. And everybody that's ever made a fortune, you know, has had many failures. We just don't know about them. You know, Michael Bloomberg was fired from Merrill Lynch. He got his, he got, he's got his revenge by starting Bloomberg. He's a billionaire now. Um, you know, Steve Jobs was fired from a company. Uh, Madonna was fired from Dunkin' Donuts. I won't go there. Um, Robert Redford was fired from an oil company. Um, and I'm sure at the time they were like, why is this happening to me? But you got to look back on it and add it as it happens to you within reason and say, what is positive about this? Well, what's positive about this is I've been mistreated. And so I have a chip on my shoulder and I prove the world wrong. And that's what like firms like Sequoia, a lot of the, the entrepreneurs they invest in, they they love this inferiority complex, so to speak. And I'm paraphrasing that. Uh, but somebody that has been told they can't do something because they're motivated to prove the world wrong. Like sometimes the best entrepreneurs to invest in are the ones that got fired from previous companies they've started. Like Elon Musk. He was fired by PayPal. Yeah. So, Yeah. He was fired. And the reason he was fired is because the board of directors uh, sided with Peter Thiel because Peter Thiel wanted to use uh, Linux to scale the organization instead of .NET, which is what Elon wanted to use, which is .NOT, based on ActiveX or CaptiveX. That's nerd humor. Yeah. But what I would do, yeah, is I would look at it as, as a blessing in disguise. Yeah. What's positive about this? Yeah. And if anybody out there is frustrated working uh, at a company and you're being mistreated, I say this with love in my heart, good because that will motivate you to get a better job or to start your own company to get revenge. And I hate, 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 hate corporate bullies. But I love that it occurs sometimes, like it occurred to me, because it forced me to start my own companies. And so in hindsight, frustration is a good thing. Yeah, embrace it, yeah. And whatever business problems or career problems that anybody has, if you want to share them with me, I'm here to humbly help you. That's why I'm here, because I've been there. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Eduardo wrote, uh, hey, Chris, is it necessary to create a business plan to open an, an Airbnb property, or do you think Airbnb has already made the business plan uh, for me? Uh, by the way, my son is coming into uh, March Nationals. Awesome, Taekwondo. Awesome, I, I love it, man. I love it. Nice, nice. I did Taekwondo as a kid. My dad warned me not to do it because I'd hurt my back. And I was like, I'm going to do it anyway. I hurt my back. But they teach you how to roll, right? Yeah. Uh, congratulations on that. Yeah. So with Airbnb, I don't think you have to write a business plan. You know, the startup costs are somewhat minimal. Uh, in fact, Airbnb, when I used to have Airbnb, and this, this room actually here was an Airbnb room many years ago, which covered my mortgage. Um, uh, Airbnb sent a photographer to my house to take pictures and everything. Right. So what you want to do is call Airbnb and ask them for support. You know, what are the startup costs? What do you guys provide us with? Can you send somebody to, to our house and take pictures, et cetera? Yeah. You also want to check Eduardo if it's legal where you live. Yeah. Some places it's not. And before anybody buys a house, what I want you to do is I want you to think about 
is there a way I could rent a room in this house? Like when you look at houses to buy, you know, look to see if there are external entrances to certain rooms or if you can put up doors, which is what I did. I actually rented a couple of rooms in my house. There's external doors and stuff to Airbnb. So when you're buying a house, look to see if you can Airbnb part of it to more than cover the mortgage. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me go back here over to Zoom. Okay. A bunch of people are on Zoom, but nobody has questions. Um, but just r raise your hand and I'll, and I'll come and answer questions there. Thanks. Okay. Okay. And Ake wrote, I would vouch for uh, Choli uh, Matur. Just amazing. Dude, I, I'm in. I'm going to order that this, this Friday at my, my, my favorite Indian restaurant. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to Todd Brown, who wrote, uh, hello, Chris. I uh, hope all is well. God bless you. And thank you for this weekly live uh, Q&A. Thank you. Uh, could you briefly, God bless you more. Can you briefly explain the inverted yield curve and how it's used in macroeconomics regarding hedge funds today? Absolutely. Okay. So, the United States government, what they do is they set interest rates and whatever interest rate they set, meaning short-term interest rates, is basically what banks charge plus a little bit more. Okay. So when interest rates go up, obviously it hurts us, right? And vice versa. Now I'm going to show you this with respect to the 30 year as well, which impacts all of us when it comes to our mortgages. So the way to analyze the data uh, when it comes to the yield curve, I'll explain this from scratch, is you go right here to treasury.gov, United States Treasury Department. Then you go to data, and then you go to daily treasury par yield curve rates. And you can look at the historical rates here. So every chart tells a story. So what I'm gonna do is first of all, talk about what rates were on January 3rd, 2022. Okay, so the world was a very different place. This is uh, before Putin invaded uh, Russia. Um, we were about to have a, this wonderful soft landing for the global economy. Uh, and then uh, Putin invaded Russia, or pardon, Putin invaded <laughs> Ukraine, uh, which sent uh, oil prices up materially, uh, which is inflationary, which is why rates are high. Okay, so we go back here to uh, January 3rd, 2022. Uh, the short-term rate was 0.05%, basically 0%, right? And this was the uh, part of the pandemic uh, approach of, of you know, basically having rates at zero so people would spend more to help the economy. And back then, right, um, the 30 year was 2%, right? And so a lot of people were refinancing their mortgages, their 30 year mortgage. Now you wouldn't get a 2% 30 year on your mortgage. It would be higher, like five, 6% or whatever it is higher because we are more risky than the US government. Okay, so this is a healthy yield curve, a normal yield curve, I should say, where rates are low today, but they're higher in the future. That's what, that's what yield curves look like. Then what happened was in November of 2023, the yield curve became inverted. I'll show you in a second. But just remember, a normal yield curve is like this from early 2022. Lower rates now, higher rates in the future. Okay, And, and what that means is this. If people expect, right, the market sets these rates here, okay? The government sets this rate. If rates are higher, okay, in the future, in 30 years, it means that the market thinks, hey, things are going to get better, so the government will be raising rates in the future. However, what happened was this normalized normal yield curve here, low high, got inverted in November of last year. And I'll show you the data here, which is scary. And I'll tell you why in a second. But let's go down here to November, right here. Okay, good. All right, so in November, what happened was it started to get inverted to the extent that rates, short-term and long-term rates were the same, right? Uh, and then what happened uh, was uh, long-term rates started to get higher on certain days, okay? So rates went up to 3.72%, which is a massive, massive move in 11 months, okay, for the short-term rate. And then the 30-year was higher, okay? Well, it's higher and then it went lower right here, I should say. I mean lower. Okay, so here, this is kind of an issue. And if it's slightly lower, it's not a big issue. But if there's a big differential, like 100 basis points, it's a massive issue. So let's look at the data today and I'll explain why this is relevant to all of us. Okay, let's go to current month, see if this works. Yay, here we go. Okay, this is a big deal. Okay, so right here at the beginning of February, 
Short-term rates were 4.59%, a massive move year over year of over 400 basis points. But the 30-year was lower. So that means that the yield curve is inverted. So instead of the yield curve looking like this, it looks like this, okay? That's scary. Because what that's basically saying is that people are expecting us to be in a recession. Because if the government is going to be cutting rates in the future, then that means that the economy is not going to be doing well. That's usually when government cuts rates, when the economy is not doing well. And almost every time this has occurred, okay, meaning an inverted yield curve where rates today are higher and lower in 30 years, almost every time historically this has occurred, a recession has come. Deadly. Deadly. So that's what that implies. Okay. And it impacts all of us because obviously our our mortgage rates are, are based on that yield curve as well. Okay. And let me go over here, see if there's anybody with their hands up. I don't see any hands up. Okay. All right. Um, a lot of people here in, in the YouTube room, just lift your hand up if you have a question, and then I'll come to you guys. All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. And if you have additional questions, uh, please let me know and, and thank you. All right. Um, okay. And and Nikolai, I uh, wrote here, uh, this is great. Can I join here every week? I have to go and teach. Uh, I'm teaching math and taking the CFA as well uh, as investing. Uh, maybe sh I should enroll in the MBA program. I, I'd love to have you. Let me give you a tip though uh, for the CFA to save you money. Okay. So what you can do is... I wrote the CFA years ago, okay? And with the CFA, they recommend, they, they give you a list of a ton of really boring textbooks to read that will cost you 500 bucks to a thousand bucks. Don't buy those. I want you to buy the Schweizer. Okay, this is the one I used years ago, right? I want you to buy the Schweizer books, right? From, uh, from a company called Kaplan, which is owned by the Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos. But these books here, and you can buy all of them used for 30 bucks on eBay. This is how you study for it. If everything is condensed, completely condensed. So go to eBay and do a search on Schweizer um, uh, and buy, buy ones published in the past couple of years. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'd love to have you join our, our program as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, Ali, hey, Ali, how are you? Uh, Ali wrote, uh, YouTube CEO says she might be resigning. Uh, is this true? Uh, I don't know. I, I've, I've not seen the data. I know that YouTube is having issues as well uh, because of competition uh, from TikTok for verticals, etc. Yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, competition is good for the consumer. Okay, Nicole, I wrote, where can you see inflows and outflows in mutual funds? My last question. Just do a search on mutual fund inflows and outflows. You'll find plenty of data. And it's one of the leading indicators you should look at always. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, Dan wrote, I'm seeing the yield curve uh, data uh, on YouTube, but not on Zoom. I'm so sorry, Dan. I, I didn't share the screen over YouTube, um, or pardon me, over, over Zoom. But if you rewind uh, the video on YouTube, you, should, or YouTube, you should, should be able to see it. Okay. And then you wrote, it's okay. I see you now. Awesome. All right, guys. I'm going to take a, a, a quick break. Um, please enter more questions or join Zoom. Uh, and I'll come back to answer your questions. Uh, this here is a, is a, a vlog we recently created. I, I hope you enjoy it. I'll, I'll be right back. Thank you. You are your own worst enemy. If you think that he or she is out of your league, you're so money, you don't even know. So there's this concept I came up with called the Networking Match Equation Strategy, or NME, enemy. It, it applies uh, to dating uh, and to networking. And I explain this in more detail, okay? Why my enemy strategy, your own, your own worst enemy, will change your life. But let me give you an example first in dating, okay? And then we will apply it to networking for a job or networking for a customer or networking for any reason, really. Have you ever seen somebody else dating somebody and the person they're dating is way better looking than they are. Uh, of course you have. Uh, and you wonder to yourself, how did this person get that other person to go out with them? You know, how did this guy get that perfect woman to go out with them or vice versa? She is so gorgeous, smart, outgoing, and personable. But he is not good looking guy and not the smartest guy. 
how the heck did this guy get in a relationship that doesn't match his looks or intelligence? Now let's bring this equation into balance. Okay, the enemy equation, stick with me here. So he believes in his heart that he's a 10 and she'll believe the same thing. So he's a one out of 10, okay? We, got, we need nine things to get him up to a 10 out of 10, okay, to make this equation balance. This has a lot to do with networking as well, okay? So he's a one out of 10. He thinks he is at first. But he's outgoing, okay? That's another point. Okay, good, so now he's two out of 10. He's personable, that's another one. Now he's three out of 10. Okay, he deals well with rejection or failure. We're at four now. He's a risk taker, that's a five. He thinks long-term knowing that the pain of not spending the rest of his life with her is way higher than the pain of him getting rejected by her. Okay, now we're at a six. He asks, that's a big one, he asks. You never get what you want in life. You'll never get a raise, promotion, a date, or anything without asking. Okay, we're at seven. He thinks more with his heart and less with his head. He's passionate. We're at eight now. He's incredibly unique, interesting, and impressive in his own ways. We're at 10. The equation is now in balance. Wait a minute. He has more positive qualities. But why do we care? I mean, the equation is in balance. He's a 10, she's a 10. Well, that's the problem. We need five more, so she thinks that he is way out of her league. Oh yeah, we forgot that he is passionate about everything in life, including his job, because he doesn't have a job, he has a passion. He's now a 15, he's passionate about everything in his life, and she's a 10. So in his mind, he is 50% out of her league. That gives him the confidence to ask her out on a date. You are your own worst enemy. If you think that he or she is out of your league, not only are you on par with them, you're up here, you're out of their league. The same thing with networking. You can ask anybody you want, not only out on a date, but also for a networking meeting. Why is analyzing love and dating relevant? Well, networking and dating is identical. So if you've ever asked somebody out on a date, you were kind of networking. So confidence leads to perceived competence, always, 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 always. Okay, great. Well, I, I hope you guys have enjoyed uh, this week's uh, 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 Q&A session. Um, please like and subscribe, and, and I'll see you next week and every week. And Hold on a second, guys. We, we got breaking news I got to go to. Okay, hold on. Hello, my name is Bob Burgundy from Haroon News Network, that's HNN, and I've got breaking news for you. It looks like technology behemoth Apple is trying to buy Nintendo. Breaking news, breaking news. I don't know if the deal will go through. I have to ask a number of our strategic advisors here to help us out to find out if this deal in fact will go through. And so the first strategic advisor that I wanna ask is an expert in economics management and strategy. He works at a consulting firm called McKinsey and his name is Chip Patterson. Chip, what are your thoughts? Yes, thank you, Bob, for that uh, introduction. Um, so I, this is an extraordinary deal and I think it might make sense, but I'm not really sure yet. And so uh, here at McKinsey and Company, we pride ourselves on advising the most incredible companies and government agencies in the world. And so uh, by the end of this MBA degree program, uh, my fellow classmates here uh, will help me to analyze if this extraordinary deal makes a lot of sense or not. Thank you. And, uh, uh, cheerio. Thank you, Chip. The next expert we're going to ask is a finance and accounting expert who works at an investment bank called MHS, Morgan Haroon Sachs. His name is Gordon Lizard. Gordon, what are your thoughts on this deal? Thanks, Bob. I, I really appreciate it. Eh? Um, so here at uh, uh, Morgan Haroon Sachs, uh, MHS actually, um, we're going to do a really deep dive to understand the financial statements of, um, you know, Nintendo and, and Apple. Uh, and, and I pride myself on being an amazing investment wanker, banker. Sorry. Uh, and, and we're actually going to have to have a lot of my fellow students here uh, during the Haroon Education Ventures MBA degree program help me to build out the financials. And don't worry, I know a lot of us don't understand yeah, how finance and accounting works, but we will by the end of this MBA degree program. In fact, here's what we're gonna do, eh? We're gonna figure it all out together. 
We're going to create the financial model, meaning the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, etc. For uh, Nintendo as well as for Apple. And it's a bit complicated because Nintendo's an international company. Uh, and so their financial statements are a little bit different uh, from Apple. But we're going to figure it out, eh? Uh, and then what we're going to do is um, we're actually going to value the company using uh, discounted cash flow uh, as well as price earnings multiple, price to revenue, um, and, and other, other metrics as well. And so that by the end of this MBA degree program, we will know how much Apple should potentially pay for uh, Nintendo. Thanks, Bob. Back to you. Thank you, Gordon. Our next expert is somebody that knows a lot about uh, sales, marketing, and communication, and his name is Stephen Ive. Stephen, you work at Apple. What are your thoughts on this deal? Thank, thank you, um, thank you, uh, uh, Bob. I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, so uh, it's it's going to be in, um, important for me to convince um, our our board. Um, and, and shareholders to um, uh, approve of the deal. Um, and I'm not much of a presenter, um, but I know that a lot of my fellow students here uh, in the Huron Education Metrics uh, MBA degree program are gonna be able to help me to learn how to present much, much better uh, in the um, uh, SMC classes, that um, sales, um, marketing and communication classes so that um, they'll give me advice and together we'll be able to learn how to present um, to the board of, of Apple and, and the shareholders to convince them to the deal makes sense or, 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 if it, or if it doesn't. Thank you, Bob. Back to you. Thank you, Stephen. Our next expert is an entrepreneurship expert uh, named Tony Shark. Now, Tony was about to sign an exclusive contract with Apple for his virtual reality goggles and his company, Shark Virtual Reality. Tony, is this deal still going through for you or because Nintendo has a great VR product, does Apple no longer need you, Tony? And what are you gonna do about this? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, so I was supposed to sign this exclusive contract with, um, with Apple for my, uh, you know, shark virtual reality goggles. Um, I, I think our product is a lot better than Nintendo's. And in the entrepreneurship track of this MBA degree program, uh, my fellow students and I are gonna work on a way to sell um, this product to Apple. And so th this product's amazing. Uh, I mean, you know, there, there's a hardware component to it, which has low margins. Uh, and then there's a software component to it with media, which is where you stream it. And it, it's really high margins. We, we got a great product here, much better than anybody else in the market. Uh, and so uh, last thing I'll say, Bob, and thanks again for having me on your show, is that uh, by the end of this uh, MBA degree program, uh, my, my fellow classmates and I uh, will be armed with this and we'll have what it takes uh, to be able to, to succeed in business uh, and take our, our careers to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Our next guest is somebody off the street here, a random person I just met whose goal is to work at Apple. Uh, and um, I, I wanna ask you from a personal growth perspective, how do you think you can get a job at Apple? So this guy's name here is Joe Jobs. How are you gonna get that job? Yeah, um, thanks for uh, for having me on the show, Bob. I really appreciate it. So, so my dream has always been to work at Apple, and I think I got what it takes. Uh, and I know that uh, my fellow classmates and I in this uh, Haroon Education Ventures MBA degree program, uh, in the personal growth classes, we're going to learn just a ton so that uh, we can all get the job of our dreams. We'll learn how to interview and all that stuff. But I'm looking forward to getting a lot of help from my fellow classmates so that... Um, you know, we can get that dream job. I, I think I got what it takes. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Joe. Well, there you have it. We talked to five experts who are gonna help us understand how this deal is structured, if this deal will go through and whatnot. Uh, and by the end of this Haroon Education Ventures MBA degree program, you will all be armed with enough skills to understand from five different perspectives whether or not this deal makes sense. And those five perspectives are as follows. Economics, management, and strategy. Sales, marketing, and communication. Entrepreneurship. Personal growth. And finance and accounting. I'm Bob Burgundy signing out here from Haroon, Ed Haroon News Network, HNN.
when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your your life is just to live your life inside the world. Try not to bash into the walls too much. Uh, uh, try to have a nice family life. Uh, have fun. Save a little money. Um, but life. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again.